All right, fantastic. <laughs> okay. This is now <laughs> the circle, okay? Welcome back. My name is Van Sakwa. You're watching Why in the Morning. This segment is about entrepreneurship. And this uh, today's interesting topic is all about money. And I remember before we took a break, I had asked you, where does money come from? You know, all these hard stories of, you know, you borrow, like they tell you, go borrow money from a friend or go to a bank, get money or save or start a business but the question is this capital specifically now money the item or the commodity of trade where exactly does it come from so we're going to talk about that and also the conversation just around you know how money uh, works uh, the relationship be you, you have with money uh, from you know a banker's perspective to now as a, 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 a monenji a common monenji perspective and uh, whatnot so we're going to actually have a very interesting conversation about that and joining us live in studio with us is uh, Edwin Masai Mushira. He is a financial consultant and he has had also an opportunity to work with some of the leading banks in Kenya, including IM Bank, SBM Bank, and he's also a business owner as well. So he'll tell us uh, how he went like from working in the banking industry to becoming a business owner and much more. So take a pen and paper and come close to your TV. And good morning. A good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Welcome to I254. Nice to have you. Thank you so much. Right. So um, we, we were having a conversation behind the scenes and uh, we are actually just trying to like uh, uh, get through a quick run through of what exactly happens when it comes to matters money and banking to you from a professional perspective. What do you think should be the conversation starter when it comes to, you know, the conversation about money? Where should we begin from? Uh, money is a broad is a broad conversation that is actually very, very interesting in regards to where it starts, how you're going to use, how you're going to expound it, how you're going to um, get people to work with it. Uh, by working with it, is it um, how do you get investors on board if you're doing a business? If you are working, how do you manage your finances? How do you look at what aspect of things to, to look at? So there are very many ways of looking at money. Mm -hmm. And probably the best is how to get the money or what money is in the first place. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's why maybe we should start. We should start. So what is money? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. <laughs> Person in Nini. And where does it come from? <laughs> so right. earlier on, as we were, as we were talking uh, about, about, about this, there was the, the inside joke of um, what is money. Right. So bankers say money is stationary, where uh, basically um, you look at it as, as paper, or as um, as coins, so to speak. So don't look at the value of the money. Uh, money, however, has value, and value is pegged uh, currently in Kenya by the CBK and of where we are. Right. And um, money is a form of trade. And um, it depends with what you're looking at. Do you want to buy shopping? Do you want to buy to pay school fees? Do you want to buy a house? Do you, do you want to rent out a car? So money is a means of um, satisfying needs and wants right yes so basically it's it's like a, it's like you need to have money you can't escape you can't go through life without it <laughs> unfortunately uh, right now we can't work without money that's right. where we are um right. and for to ensure that the es essentials of life are, are met money is key in all this right uh, uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about now, um, let's say the local person, uh, a person who is not financially literate. Um, uh, I remember behind the scenes we talked about, we talked about, you know, when you get your first million, how do you handle it? Are you going to spend it? Like, and you mentioned your spending habits. Uh, for, for example, a student, a campus student, let's use example for campus student, you've just been given 700,000. How do you actually plan from that money so that at the end of the day, um, you have something meaningful out of it. In as much as yes, you're going to spend it, of course money is meant to be spent or saved and any other thing that happens to it. Now from a person that uh, should be maybe, let's say, have some form of understanding of the dynamics of how to actually handle that, where do they begin from? That's a brilliant question. Um, where do you start? Uh, the better question is where do you start with a shilling? Um, everything is on principles principles of money, how do you handle money, how do you handle your needs. Um, there's a basic rule where you, you split the money into three ways, 50%, 30%, and 20%. Also, it's 50, 30, 20 rule? Yes. Wow. 
So, um, this will explain. <laughs> yes. Um, so 50%, basically this goes back to the conversation where we had when your kids, what are needs, what are wants, and how can you split in between two. So um, let me start. So needs are essentials that we cannot do without. And wants are things or items or activities that can better your life. Right. And the third aspect would be savings. So on the 50%, that's where you spend on your needs, that's on your house rent. Um, if it is a student, that's where now you look at books, uh, essentials, if you're looking at shopping, basic shopping. Um, then on the other hand, you look at the needs. So you know, from there, with the needs, you move to the wants, which is about 30%. Now for the ones, these are things that better your life. You want better clothes, better shoes, um, you want a matatu, now you want, to, you want a car. So those are things that look at wants and those um, things that can be able to readjust. Right. For instance, if your wants go beyond what you're having, you can reduce them. However, the needs, those are items that you cannot reduce. Right. For instance, you cannot reduce the amount you eat. It right. is you need to eat to move. Right. You need to pay that bus it's fare. Like it's mandatory. Indeed. Right. So um, those are aspects that are really, really important to, to, to look at. So that's where the 50% goes at. Um, for the last or the 20%, um, that's where you look at um, savings or emergency fund. It's, right. it's also a small but a very broad area as well. Right. For instance, on emergency fund, you look at um, medical care. If you're not in an institution where um, you're being given medical, uh, medical insurance, you need to save up for it. You need to save up for retirement. That is something else people don't really look at. Is it like a financial plan? Is that what we call now financial planning? Yes. Okay. So we, you need to have these things way, way before you have the money. Oh, oh you need, it's like your manifest. <laughs> it's like you're planning for 10 million that you don't have. Um, yes, yes and no. Okay. Um, yes, you need to plan for what you don't have. Mm -hmm. However, you need to plan for what is adequate. Okay. So um, <clears throat> you need to look at this is, uh, this is the level that I need to be. Those are the, the ones. Okay. And this is really what I need to do so that I can be able to get to this point okay. or to survive. And then there's what you look at after. Um, it's always said that most middle class Kenyans are one disease away from poverty. How mm -hmm. do you negate yourself from that? It is right. from the 20%. It is right. from these savings that you put across. It is not very easy to convert land buildings and, and cars when you have a an, an medical emergency. You need cash. Right. So there are, there are instruments that you can be able to use, like unit trusts, uh, fixed deposits, uh, simple deposits. So there are things that you can be able to do and, and uh, invest in, in that 20% that right. really doesn't look much. Right. but will elevate you from problems when you are in those dire problems. Right. Yes. Interesting, interesting. Now, uh, from a financial expert's perspective, of course you worked at a bank, and uh, you, the transaction, I'm sure there's like a many million transactions that happen in a day, or maybe in an hour, uh, especially in, in, you said there's tiers of banks, like first, second, third. Um, at what point uh, in your experience, uh, when you see a person making a transaction and you say, bro, you have bad spending habits, or from the way you're spending, clearly you need something. Like you need to actually correct on your expenditure or your spending habits. What is the philosophy behind that? Um, in banking, there are various things that people look at. Um, for starters, what you talked about, the spending habits. Uh, you bank a check today, or you get an RTGS in today, or you just get money deposit your money in today. Then two hours in, it's out. That's a red flag. That means you don't have what bankers call retention. Okay. You, can't, you can't retain your earnings. So mm -hmm. if your earnings are not uh, traceable in terms of um, the, the rule that I gave you earlier, then okay. that showcases that it's a red flag. Okay. There are individuals who actually have a lot of money, but their spending habits do not correlate to the money they have, and the people who have way less money and they qualify for very huge loans. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about um, Mamambogas and um, at Gekomba and other inform informal or MSCs. Right. So they usually, if they have very good spending habits or saving habits, mm -hmm. they can get access to a lot of finance or money in terms of banking. Right. So those are the things that you look at. Right. Um, and we tend to advise clients on how to mitigate this and how to 
help them in get into this. So with the rule, for instance, you can uh -huh. allocate like 1% okay. or five, 1 to 5% of the money that came in yeah. as a retention value. So that okay. now the account becomes, they can be able to, to correlate with how you are able to, to retain your money. So it becomes easier to get facilities. All right. Yes. Interesting as well. Now, uh, I'd also like you to tell us, uh, for example, a person who is earning, let's say, 50000 how can they like ensure they retain that money to a point they're not going above it or little below it either? But I think it's good to go below it. <laughs> I'd like to hear your your point on that and that one as well. And then maybe a person who who is earning a million, like what should be their expenditure uh, plan or schedule, uh, for instance? Um, I, th I think in terms of money, I don't think. Um the value, or if I may use the stationary term, the quantity of money that you have right. on earnings uh, should determine how you should spend. Okay. How you should spend is based on on your lifestyle and how oh, you plan your lifestyle. lifestyle. It's not about the, the amount of money, it's the lifestyle, the life yes. you need, quality of life. Yes. Interesting. So um, you may get, for instance, as you give an example, a person earning 50,000, they may say, the money in too little, I can get um, to work maybe by 20th and I was paid on first. Um, mm -hmm. I can't get my shopping right. I need to send something home. I need, right. I need, I need. So there's so many so-called There's emergencies needs. along the way, remember? Yes. And but you talked about emergency funds. You yes. talk about that as well. Yeah. But remember, it is not the need, the need, the need. There's uh -huh. needs and there's wants. wants. And uh -huh. there's savings. Right. So just need to go back to, to that drawing board again. Mm -hmm. So at 50K, um, you realize that this particular point you can't do really much, but you need to split this with the wants and the needs and the savings. Right. And then again, in the savings, other than just putting money aside, you can use part of that money to improve your life. Right. In terms of getting higher education, saving for higher education, saving for a better cause, um, saving for a cause for that will teach you how to do a passive uh, income. Uh, a passive activity that raise passive income that would not affect your current active job. Right. So these again will increase your ceiling on savings and increase your activities therein. Right. So you can be able to gain more from the 50K probably to 100. Right. Um, the major thing that is a drawback is uh, people talk about is pay or tax, so to speak. Right. So from the savings perspective, the aspect that you can do, like for instance, was telling about the unit trusts, Right. Um, these aspects, they can actually be able to cushion you on this. Right. Because um, if you look at um, maybe like a life insurance, there's, um, there's a tax rebate on that. So the more you, you save, the more tax rebate you, right. you get from the government. And then more you have more spending amounts on your end. Right. So um, the guy with a million bob, uh, probably it was, um, it was not instant it was again from the 50k right. um, again if you win a lottery you don't just spend it all you still fo follow the rules and ensure that you're frugal in your spending right. not mean but right. frugal right. so that now you ensure that um, everything is taken care of by everything I mean maybe you're paying your mortgages you're paying your school fees you're paying your car loan um, again you're sending enough money home or you're taking care of your family at the same same time, you're putting money aside for your retirement and medical and contingency funds. Right. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. You reminded me of something that we asked the youth, the millennials. We talk about having a steady flow of income. You know, wait until I'm financially stable. I'll do it. <coughs> Is there anything like that, by the way, that, you know, having a steady flow of income and, you know, financial and financially stable? Is there anything like that? Like that? Um, Again, goes to the quality of life that one is looking at. Uh -huh. um, at the same same time, we look at various ways that one can be able to to focus on. Um, okay. Unfortunately, there's you can to the question. The, the answer to that question is there's not really there's no time really you will say that you're financially stable. So let's say you own a house and have a car or two. Um, again, you want a bigger house. Um, you have your kids, now you have maybe grown kids, they want to go to a better school, uh, right. don't go abroad. So you'll never be stable, so to speak. 
Mm -hmm. So the stability all depends on how you lay down your needs and wants and right. again on savings. It still goes, goes down to those basics. To the plan now again. Yes. So uh -huh. if it works within the plan, you are perfect. Right. If you spend more on the savings and you don't have food, you'll go back to the savings and take away the savings. Right. So the best thing is to understand where you are and the direction that you're headed and understand that you can be able to grow your income. Right. Maybe adding up on another passive income as well, so that can be able to add more income on your, on, right. on your, on your plate. Right. Yes. There's a place I was reading, and uh, <laughs> they were saying if you're 30 and above as a man, you should have at least two streams of income, and you mentioned uh, passive <coughs> income. Now, in relation to that, um, even in our country as well, uh, we have, it's called debt crisis. Uh, it's like we are living on debt. Is it possible for us, as a country, and now let's narrow it down to an individual to like just live a debt free life where you don't owe anyone, no bank, no digital money lending system, and all of that. In as much as yes, we want to have these SMEs, they need funding. And somebody also mentioned that even the biggest businesses are surviving on debt, it's a, a debt servicing. Yeah, uh, talk about that as well. Um, debt is interesting. Uh, what I mean by interesting is how let's go back to how you create money. Mm -hmm. Banks create money by giving you loans so that now you pay back in interest. Where exactly. does this money come from? Money comes from deposit that you're putting in the bank. Mm -hmm. So the bank looks at your deposit as liabilities or rather debt. Liabilities? Yes. Deposits? Yes. <laughs> yeah, deposits are debt because they, they need to pay you a certain interest at the right. end of the year. Uh -huh. This is debt they owe you this money. They have borrowed, so to speak, this money from you from you right. so when now another borrower comes and right. they they issue the money mm -hmm. the income they gain from that interest called interest income oh, or interest income. on their okay. end it's mm -hmm. assets to the bank now. yes mm -hmm. so that's why on the banking side when you get your statement it's opposite where you think it, it's your deposits it's a credit because mm -hmm. the bank views you as a as liability, a liability. Bro, that, that, that's bad news. <laughs> no, that's good news for you because you earn interest. But you're so, a liability already. No, not, not really. The mm -hmm. bank views you as a liability. By liability, I mean you're, you're an expense. Right. Um, so again, how, what do you deal with people who owe you money? You call mm -hmm. them up, you talk to them nicely. That's what the bank does to you. You have noticed when they call you up, oh, your deposits are looking nice. Uh, please stop up, etc, etc, etc. They are always <coughs> on you to ensure that you are comfortable. You don't withdraw your money to get to another bank. So these are aspects that, uh, that move around the debt issue. So, so to speak, um, debt is not bad, but bad debt is bad. Yeah, <laughs> please explain that bad debt is bad. Like, how bad is a bad debt? <laughs> For example, I, I don't know, we owe more than 10 trillion Kenyan shillings uh, to our lenders, including China as well. China is like one of our, uh, our biggest debtors, uh, um, including the IMF. I don't know if we, we owe the IMF, but our debt is really, we would say it's bad debt, I'm sure. What's your opinion on that? Um, it's, it just goes down to the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, everyone wants to have cheap debt or no debt at all. Right. So high collateral debt is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, high collateral debt is um, not something that you want to, to look at. It affects other things like inflation. Right. So um, the country or the, rather the government may prefer to go to such institutions or rather external borrowing other than right. internal borrowing right. because the internal borrowing will foster more inflation, which is bad for us. Which is your experience. We're experiencing it right now, right? Yes. Like, in fact, it's both, both internal and external now for the country. Yes. So uh, the government is usually trying as much as possible to have external debt instead of internal debt. Right. Because when you borrow internally, how, or rather, how did the, the government borrow internally? Okay. They have treasury bonds, um, T-bills, and these are floated by the CBK or the treasury. And when this happens, um, if they borrow so much internally, their rates go higher. So they're usually seen as um, very safe investment portfolios for one to have. Yeah. So if you look at something that is about nine, close to 11%, that's really, really high on a, on a treasury bill. Right. 
Right. So this translates to banking because in the bank, they would rather buy those T-bills than give you money because they're sure the government will pay. They're not right. sure you're going to pay. Right. So on your end, what's going to happen? They're going to, in, to increase their rates to you. Right. So that now they can put that risk instead of giving the money to the government, they give the money to you. So that fosters inflation. That's why now the money becomes expensive. Right. Um, getting loans up to 18, 20 percent. No. Currently, there are about um, three banks now that have the go ahead to have um, risk based pricing on, on loans. So right. we are looking at higher interest rates coming up very, very soon. Right. So this again is bad for inflation. Right. So um, international debt, so to speak, right. or external debt is um, not something to look up to, but at the same, same time it is necessary to ensure yeah. that certain elements and infrastructure um, are taking place. Right. So the only aspect is to ensure that it is well manageable um, yeah. in, in areas that you can be able to repay. Right. Yes. Uh, on that note, how can a person, um, I'm trying to find the right word in my mind, uh, how can you, uh, let's say, uh, manage uh, debt individually, well, like managing debt, well, effectively, and literally now breaking away from it, like not living in debt, kabsa, kabsa, kabsa. is it possible to like, uh, for example, you borrowed, let's say you borrowed five million, <laughs> and then you try to buy shamba, and then you can a place, at kosa pesa za kulipa. But now it's like now you're a slave. You owe you owe whoever you owe the money to. How can you manage it effectively to a point it's not now detrimental to any other flow of income that you have? Um, debt crisis, personal debt crisis, is a, is a huge, huge, huge problem. And when you're looking at debt crisis, you're looking at ways and means that you can be able to to reduce this. Okay. And sometimes it is not as easier said than done. Right. So you look at the entire figure, how you are, okay. and then you look at income streams that can come in place. Right. And then um, you start scheduling based on high priority to okay. lowest priority, so to speak. And then um, you go back to your table. You need to reduce on your wants because needs really, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. You can't stay without water or food. Is it or possible for someone to like, have expensive needs? <laughs> like your needs are so <laughs> expensive, they're almost translating to wants. And you have to cut it down. Yes, um, that's, that's, the, that's the conversation. You need to understand what are your needs and what are your wants. And unfortunately, sometimes you need to make um, expensive decisions or heavy decisions. Right. What I mean is, uh, for instance, you're having a, a big car that is a guzzler and right now you're in debt, you need to downgrade either yeah. to a smaller car or maybe from three to one car. Um, that means you're losing <laughs> the, the value of that not, car. <laughs> not really. Um, by, by cutting back, uh -huh. you give yourself a chance to, to move back up faster and easier. Because right. now with debt, with, with bad debt, you're uh -huh. in CRB, you cannot access to finance, you cannot start another business, you yeah. cannot be able to do these things. And that's why right now there's, so many, there, there's rise of so many uh, microfinances. Some are not governed. And that's right. why some of them get rogue because you are unbankable, so to speak, right. because you have very bad debt. Right. So to ensure that does not take place, you cut back, cut back on, on, your, um, on, your, on your needs, on your expensive needs, mm -hmm. and then push them to wants. And then right. now from the wants, you look at what you can let go. Right. Then from there, now you can go back. Because um, a good example is when you have a um, medical crisis, you can easily go to bad the debt. emergency fund also, yes, you can you easily, yes, because you can use it, you can um, entirely utilize it, and it's over. They go back and now borrow against it, maybe a shamba or something, right. and you get into bad debt. Right. So on such things, that's when you start cutting back, and that is when you look at what works right. for you. All right. Thank you, fantastic. Now, let's switch gears a little bit to savings. <laughs> the conversation should be on savings culture. Uh, uh, it, 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 we began and I mentioned to you, for example, you're given 700,000 and all of a sudden you don't have it. Now, in, in this generation of, you know, millennials, content creators, and you want to impress, literally, because you're, you're young, you're energetic and all that. Now, uh, do you feel like we have... Uh, 
a consistent, a consistent pattern when it comes to uh, financial literacy. And at, at what point should we start instilling uh, this culture from our kids? Uh, I remember there was a time we had a conversation with a friend of mine and they were telling me, kids in Japan, uh, as early as, uh, as, as four years old, they're being taught how to you know, create a keyboard, create a computer, you know, algorithm. By the time you know, they're, they're mature, they are creating a company and employing other people. So it began at a very tender young age. Now for us here in Africa, the culture is go to school, graduate, get a job, go get employed, start saving. But now how do you figure to that place that, you know, yes, I'm employed, or yes, I'm going to start a business, which we, we commonly know, and one this should be a Sharaka, is a job. How do you figure to a place that, you know, you have a consistent saving pattern? That really starts from day one. By day one, I mean as early as possible. You'd be surprised there are so many um, families that instigate this in their kids. They ensure that their kids understand this. So how do you do this? Um, there, are some, there are some individuals and families and they give the kids certain goals. When they achieve certain goals, they get certain rewards. Now when they get these rewards, they are shown the saving culture right from then. Right. Um, these rewards could be monetary, could be um, sweets or, or presents. Um, from that point is when you teach a child how to share, teach a child how to put something you can use tomorrow um, or the next day or a few days after. It starts from there. Yeah. Then um, slowly as the, the kids age, you I've seen some bring their kids to the bank and they open an account together. They show that this is what you do and they give them maybe 100 shillings or something. Right. And then the kids come in with the parents together and the bank. Those are small aspects or elements where the kids understand that actually you need to start saving. Right. And to get rid of that aspect where um, when you get the money, Nishere, it becomes very easy when you start from day one. Tender age. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they give the, the child maybe 100 shillings, for instance, and they want to buy sweets and popcorn, they mean, no, 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 you need to put maybe 20 shillings aside. Right. And then spend the 80 shillings right. on those things. So yeah. from the 80 shillings, now tell them again, now what do you think is really important? Is this, this or this? Do you really right. need this or do you want this? Right. So you start getting that conversation really early in their life. Right. And they should go back to, again to schools. They should ensure that this is um, taught to, so that these individuals or groups, when they start early in their life and they get income, right. it becomes very easy for them to transition right. and ensure that they are frugal and not, not uh, spend thrifts. Right, interesting, thanks. Now, um, for a young person uh, who is trying to figure out life, uh, you're being told you need money. Of course you need money. <laughs> so uh, as long as you're breathing in and out, <laughs> you will need money. And those people who say, me, I'll do anything for money. I don't care if it's going to cost my soul <laughs> or it's going to cost me a person if they have to go so that I get money. Uh, what would be your advice to someone who's watching and they want to have money? But uh, of course, the basics are get a job or start a business. Where do you pick up from scratch and to, to that point now? Um, sometimes it's very difficult when you tell someone get a job. And then they'll tell you, OK, fine, then give me that job. Um, Sometimes you, you don't get honed with the skills where to start looking for a job, for instance. Um, a while back, you used, to, you used to look at newspapers. Right now, there are none, or maybe there are few for starters. So where do you start? Those are the simple things, I think, which is really important. Right. And um, one fits all doesn't really work for everyone. Right. And um, what aspects people say that you need to work with what you like and how you like it to be done. Right. Sometimes that works, but which platforms or which areas do you, should you look at? Um, there are various areas that people look at. Like there's LinkedIn, which is right now quite autonomous. Right. By autonomous, I mean it is very diverse. All right. Diverse, where you can get a lot of passive and still active or hybrid solutions no. or other um, jobs. So this is where you start. So from, from small things, that's where you start and by identifying what is the gap right. and what you're really good at. 
right. so that's where basically you start right um let's also now switch gears as well to uh the digital markets and i'd also like you to talk about uh the digital wireless now uh, because we are in a generation of tech uh almost right now every kid who is who is in school they are being taught to be tech savvy it's like among the first skills that you should have now in a generation where there's forex trading you know people being scammed left right and center oh cg mtu alikuja kaniuzia bot oh ni kampea 10000 size at your account haiko how do we how do we actually manage this to a point that we have like now certified professionals and and even investment uh, platforms that for example if i'm giving you 10000 uh, you'll be able to be accountable for that just in case maybe you're trading on my behalf because right now I understand Forex banks are also regulating Forex there's banks that are actually coming to actually help or assist people or even they're also offering that H how can someone reach and hit that pinnacle of you know having like it's professional I'm doing it professionally I'm not being scammed I'm gonna get my money right and I'm gonna hold you accountable as well uh, regulation is key mm -hmm. and um government institutions need to do their bit in terms of regulations to ensure right. the right institutions and and companies are working on board on this to ensure that um, Kenyans don't get scammed. Right. However, as Kenyans research is a key element in doing this and there are so many ways one can be able to do research and sometimes it doesn't hurt to consult someone, uh, even consult your banker, consult uh, your financial consultant, consult someone who is in that business. Right. So they can be able to give you sound advice on what works, what doesn't work. Right. Um, again... But how do, you, how do you now decipher? Of course, a financial consultant, like you're a professional, or you, you have the trust, you know, you've gained the trust because you're a professional. How can someone decipher from a person who's going to scam? But I'm sure it's possible for someone to work at a bank and scam someone. They'll be like, no, they disappeared, they, uh, they're no longer there. Uh, is it is it possible for someone to like have a trusted professional to handle their business financially? Yes, the um, the institutions that actually work on work on that professionally. However, sometimes it is best to go the traditional way. Mm -hmm. Yes, Which we are modern. Uh -huh. We are modern, but it's best to go traditional. For instance, if you pick elements like unit trusts or right. if it's forex, you're going to to banks or such elements. It is very easy to trace trace back and if you look at companies or institutions that are publicly audited it becomes very very easy for you to know their trustworthiness right. uh, and establish where they are um, a good example sometimes is not a good example let me give an example um, when you talk about liabilities there are some clients who come on board and they want to put a f good fixed deposit probably 100 or 50 right. and the question they ask What's your portfolio? What's your value? Right. What, uh, what does your bank hold? How much does your bank hold? They don't want to put their money right. in elements where, or in institutions that can actually go down maybe in a year or two. Right. So even them, for people who are coming to bank for about 150 million, right. they still ask those pertinent questions. They still go back to the audit statements. They still go back to the traditional way of ensuring that their money is safe. So yeah. the same, same time, um, when you look at digital markets, right. they are, it's broad as well, and there are so many elements. There's so there's so many elements in terms of good elements right. or good um, channels that one can actually make good money, yeah. and they should be well exploited. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think additionally, um, using cert certain instruments in banks right. can be able to to shelve you from from cons. Right. For instance, if you have a bank um, being an intermediary where the person offering the service, they're putting the money first, and then yeah. you get assured that you get the money once the service is done, okay. such instruments can be able to assist you in ensuring that this transaction is solid, okay. this transaction cannot be a con. Right. Yes. Oh my goodness, I'm being told we have two minutes to wrap up, but uh, I would have asked you about how can someone boost their credit score, but uh, it's okay. Uh, I'll briefly talk about your business and uh, uh, what you do and uh, just in case you know you're offering any services and also your financial consultancy services how can a person reach out and get in touch with you there's a number as well please uh, share with us in a minute <laughs> All right. uh, sure so um, basically um, I'm a financial consultant right. I focus on working capital solutions where 
I showcase in individuals and groups and companies on how to get working capital for for the entities nice. to move them and to foster their growth in their activities. So the best way to reach me is through through uh, social hurdles and through my phone numbers. Yeah, place you can give out. That's your camera. All right. So my phone number is zero seven two six eight hundred five nine four. And my social media Twitter is at Edwin Masai, Instagram Edwin Masai, and uh, Facebook at Edwin Masai. Yeah, let's well. repeat the number once again. If you have issues to do with money, <laughs> do you want to retain your money? <laughs> uh, you want to retain your salo? Atakama ni kidogo. If you want the tricks, please contact Edwin. Please say the number once again so that people can get it right. 0726-800-594. All right. Thank you so much, Edwin. I, I think we should have a part two of, of this conversation because it's it's an endless conversation. Sure. Yeah, and I have so many pleasure. questions. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna take a very short break, uh, but we'll be coming back with much more. We have been speaking to Edwin Masai Mushira, who is a financial consultant. Uh, I would really love to hear how you transition from like working in the banking sector to now the business. But you tell us next time as well. And thank you so much for your insights and your time and for coming through. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So, so we take a very short break. We come back with much more. Continue interacting in advance on that hashtag Why in the Morning Entrepreneurship Tuesday at Y254 Channel at Brian Soko 101 and at Eddie Masai. Eddie Masai on Instagram as well as Twitter and Facebook. <laughs>